Chapter Fifteen, Part One of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wild Justice, Part One. A crescent moon hung above the lofty peaks over the valley, and a train of white stars ran along the bold rim of the western wall. A few young frogs peeped plaintively. The night was cool, yet had a touch of balmy spring, and a sweeter fragrance as if the cedar and pinions had freshened in the warm sun of that day. Shefford and Fay were walking in the aisles of moonlight and the patches of shade, as Nas Te Bega, more than ever a shadow of his white brother, followed them silently. Fay, it's growing late. Feel the dew, said Shefford. Come, I must take you back. But the time's so short. I have said nothing that I wanted to say, she replied. Say it quickly, then, as we go. After all, it's only... Will you take me away soon? Yes, very soon. The Indian and I have talked. But we've made no plan yet. There are only three ways to get out of this country. By Stonebridge, by Cayenta, Durango, and by Red Lake. We must choose one. All are dangerous. We must lose time finding Surprise Valley. I hoped the Indian could find it. Then we'd bring Lassiter and Jane here, and hide them near till the dark, then take you and go. That would give us a night's start. But you must help us to Surprise Valley. I can go right to it, blindfolded or in the dark. Oh, John, hurry. I dread the wait. He might come again. Joe says, they won't come very soon. Is it far where we're going? Out of the country? Ten days hard riding. Oh, that night ride to and from Stonebridge nearly killed me. But I could walk very far and climb forever. Fay, we'll get out of the country if I have to carry you. When they arrived at the cabin, Fay turned on the porch step and, with her face nearer a level with his, white and sweet in the moonlight, with her eyes shining and unfathomable, she was more than beautiful. "'You've never been inside my house,' she said. "'Come in. I've something for you.' "'But it's late,' he remonstrated. "'I suppose you've got me a cake or pie, something to eat. You women all think Joe and I have to be fed.' "'No, you'd never guess. Come in,' she said and the rare smile on her face was something Shefford would have gone far to see. Well, then, for a minute. He crossed the porch, the threshold, and entered her home. Her dim, white shape moved in the darkness, and he followed into a room where the moon shone through the open window, giving soft, mellow, shadowy light. He discerned objects, but not clearly, for his senses seemed absorbed in the strange warmth and intimacy of being for the first time with her in her home. "'No, it's not good to eat,' she said, and her laugh was happy. "'Here!' Suddenly she abruptly ceased speaking. Shefford saw her plainly, and the slender form had stiffened, alert and strained. She was listening. "'What was that?' she whispered. "'I didn't hear anything,' he whispered back. He stepped softly nearer the open window and listened. Clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop. Hard hoofs on the hard path outside. A strong and rippling thrill went over Shefford. In the soft light, her eyes seemed unnaturally large and black and fearful. Clip-clop, clip-clop. The horse stopped outside. Then followed a metallic click of spur against stirrup thud of boots on hard ground, heavy footsteps upon the porch. A swift, cold contraction of throat, of breast, convulsed Shefford. His only thought was that he could not think. Oh, Mary! A voice liberated both Shefford's muscles and mind. A voice of strange, vibrant power. Authority of religion and cruelty of will. These Mormon attributes constituted that power. And Shefford suffered a transformation which must have been ordered by demons. 
The sudden flame seemed to curl and twine and shoot along his veins with blasting force. A rancorous and terrible cry leaped to his lips. Oh, Mary! Then came a heavy tread across the threshold of the outer room. Shefford dared not look at Fay, yet dimly, from the corner of his eye, he saw her, a pale shadow, turned to stone with her arms out. If he looked, if he made sure of that, he was lost. When had he drawn his gun? It was there, a dark and glinting thing in his hand. He must fly, not through cowardice and fear, but because in one more moment he would kill a man. Swift as a thought, he dove through the open window, and, leaping up, he ran under the dark pinions toward the camp. Joe Lake had been out late himself. He sat by the fire, smoking his pipe. He must have seen or heard Shefford coming, for he rose with unwanted alacrity, and he kicked the smoldering logs into a flickering blaze. Shefford, realizing his deliverance, came panting, staggering into the light. The Mormon uttered an exclamation. Then he spoke anxiously, but what he said was not clear in Shefford's thick and throbbing ears. He dropped his pipe, a sign of perturbation, and he stared. But Shefford, without a word, lunged swiftly away into the shadow of the cedars. He found relief in action. He began a steep ascent of the east wall, a dangerous slant that he had never dared even in daylight, and he climbed it without a slip. Danger, steep walls, perilous heights, night, and black canyon, the same. These he never thought of. But something drove him to desperate effort that the hours might seem short. The red sun was tipping the eastern wall when he returned to camp, and he was neither calm nor sure of himself nor ready for sleep or food. Only he had put the night behind him. The Indian showed no surprise, but Joe Lake's jaw dropped and his eyes rolled. Moreover, Joe bore a singular aspect, the exact nature of which did not at once dawn upon Shefford. By God, you've got nerve, or you're crazy, he ejaculated hoarsely. Then it was Shefford's turn to stare. The Mormon was haggard, grieved, frightened, and utterly amazed. He appeared to be trying to make certain of Shefford's being there in the flesh, and then to find reason for it. I've no nerve, and I am crazy, replied Shefford. But, Joe, what do you mean? Why do you look at me like that? I reckon if I get your horse, that'll square us. Did you come back for him? You'd better hit the trail quick. It's you now who's crazy, burst out Shefford. Wish to God I was, replied Joe. It was then Shefford realized catastrophe, and cold fear gnawed at his vitals, so that he was sick. Joe, what has happened, he asked, with the blood thick in his heart. Hadn't you better tell me, demanded the Mormon, and a red wave blotted out the haggard shade of his face. You talk like a fool, said Shefford sharply, and he strode right up to Joe. See here, Shefford, we've been pards. You're making it hard for me. Reckon you ain't square. Shefford shot out a long arm, and his hand clutched the Mormon's burly shoulder. Why am I not square? What do you mean? Joe swallowed hard and gave himself a shake. Then he eyed his comrade steadily. I was afraid you'd kill him. I reckon I can't blame you. I'll help you get away, and I'm a Mormon. Do you take the hunch? But don't deny you killed him. Killed whom? gasped Shefford. Her husband. Shefford seemed stricken by a slow, paralyzing horror. The Mormon's changing face grew huge and indistinct and awful in his sight. He was clutched and shaken in Joe's rude hands yet scarcely he felt them. Joe seemed to be bellowing at him, but the voice was far off. Then Shefford began to see, to hear through some cold and terrible deadness that had come between him and everything. So you killed him, hoarsely supplicated the Mormon. Shefford 
had not yet control of speech. Something in his gaze appeared to drive Joe frantic. Damn you, tell me quick. Say you killed him. If you want to know my stand, why, I'm glad. Shefford, don't look so stony. For her sake, say you killed him. Shefford stood with a face as gray and still as stone. With a groan, the Mormon drew away from him and sank upon a log. He bowed his head. His broad shoulders heaved. Husky sounds came from him. Then, with a violent wrench, he plunged to his feet and shook himself like a huge, savage dog. "'Reckon it's no time to weaken,' he said huskily, and with the words a dark, hard, somber bitterness came to his face. "'Where is she?' whispered Shefford. "'Shut up in the schoolhouse,' he replied. "'Did she? Did she?' She neither denied nor confessed. Have you seen her? Yes. How did she look? Cool and quiet as the Indian there, game as hell. She always had stuff in her. Oh, Joe, it's unbelievable, cried Shefford. That lovely, innocent girl. She couldn't. She couldn't. She fixed him. Don't think of that. It's too late. We ought to have saved her. God, she begged me to hurry to take her away. Think what we can do now to save her, cut in the Mormon. Shefford sustained a vivifying shock. To save her, he echoed. Think, man. Joe, I can hit the trail and let you tell them I killed him, burst out Shefford in panting excitement. Reckon I can. So help me God, I'll do it. The Mormon turned a dark and austere glance upon Shefford. You mustn't leave her. She killed him for your sake. You must fight for her now. Save her. Take her away. But the law. Law, scoffed Joe. In these wilds, men get killed, and there's no law. But if she's taken back to Stonebridge, those iron-jawed old Mormons will make law enough to... to... Shefford, the thing is, get her away. Once out of the country, she's safe. Mormons keep their secrets. I'll take her, Joe. Will you help me? Shefford, even in his agitation, felt the Mormon's silence to be a consent that need not have been asked, and Shefford had a passionate gratefulness toward his comrade. That stultifying and blinding prejudice, which had always seemed to remove a Mormon outside the pale of certain virtue, suffered final eclipse, and Joe Lake stood out as a man, strange, and crude, but with a heart and a soul. Joe, tell me what to do, said Shefford, with a simplicity that meant he needed only to be directed. Pull yourself together. Get your nerve back, replied Joe. Reckon you'd better show yourself over there. No one saw you come in this morning. Your absence from camp isn't known. It's better you seem curious and shocked like the rest of us. Come on, we'll go over and afterward we'll get the Indian and plan. They left camp, and crossing the brook, took the shaded path toward the village. Hope of saving Fay, the need of all his strength and nerve and cunning to effect that end, gave Shefford the supreme courage to overcome his horror and fear. On that short walk, under the pinions, to Fay's cabin, he had suffered many changes of emotion but never anything like this change, which made him fierce and strong to fight, deep and crafty to plan, hard as iron to endure. The village appeared very quiet, though groups of women stood at the doors of cabins. If they talked, it was very low. Henninger and Smith, two of the three Mormon men living in the village, were standing before the closed door of the schoolhouse. A tigerous feeling thrilled Shefford when he saw them on guard there. Shefford purposely avoided looking at Fay's cabin as long as he could keep from it. When he had to look, he saw several hooded, whispering women in the yard, and Beale, the other Mormon man, standing in the cabin door. Upon the porch lay the long shape of a man covered with blankets. Shefford experienced a horrible curiosity. Say, Beale, 
I fetched Shefford over, said Lake. He's pretty much cut up. Beale wagged a solemn head, but said nothing. His mind seemed absent or steeped in gloom, and he looked up as one silently praying. Joe Lake strode upon the little porch, and reaching down, he stripped the blanket from the shrouded form. Shefford saw a sharp, cold, ghastly face. Wagoner, he whispered. Yes, replied Lake. Wagoner. Shefford remembered the strange power in his face, and now that life had gone, that power was stripped of all disguise. Death, in Shefford's years of ministry, had lain under his gaze many times, and in a multiplicity of aspects. But never before had he seen it stamped so strangely. Shefford did not need to be told that here was a man who believed he had conversed with God on earth, who believed he had a divine right to rule women, who had a will that would not yield itself to death utterly. Wagoner, then, was the devil who had come masked to Surprise Valley, had forced a martyrdom upon Fay Larkin, and this was the Mormon who had made Fay Larkin a murderess. Shefford had hated him living, and now he hated him dead. Death here was robbed of all nobility, of pathos, of majesty. It was only retribution, wild justice, but alas, that it had to be meted out by a white-souled girl whose innocence was as great as the unconscious savagery which she had assimilated from her lonely and wild environment. Shefford laid a despairing curse upon his own head, and a terrible remorse knocked at his heart. He had left her alone, this girl in whom love had made the great change. Like a coward, he had left her alone. That curse he had visited upon himself, because he had been the spirit and motive of this wild justice, and his should have been the deed. Joe Lake touched Shefford's arm and pointed at the haft of a knife protruding from Wagoner's breast. It was a wooden haft. Shefford had seen it before somewhere. Then he was struck with what perhaps Joe meant him to see, a singular impression the haft gave of one sweeping, accurate, powerful stroke. A strong arm had driven that blade home. The haft was sunk deep. There was a little depression in the cloth. No blood showed, and the weapon looked as if it could not be pulled out. Shefford's thought went fatally and irresistibly to Fay Larkin's strong arm. He saw her flash that wide arm and lift the heavy bucket from the spring with an ease he wondered at. He felt the strong clasp of her hand as she had given it to him in a flying leap across a crevice upon the walls. Yes, her fine hand and the round strong arm possessed the strength to have given that blade its singular directness and force. The marvel was not in the physical action. It hid inscrutably in the mystery of deadly passion rising out of a gentle and sad heart. Joe Lake drew up the blanket and shut from Shefford's fascinated gaze that spare form, that accusing knife, that face of strange, cruel power. "'Anybody been sent for?' asked Lake of Beale. "'Yes, an Indian boy went for the Paiute. We'll send him to Stonebridge,' replied the Mormon. "'How soon do you expect anyone here from Stonebridge?' "'Tomorrow, maybe by noon. Meantime, what's to be done with this? Elder Smith thinks the body should stay right here where it fell till they come from Stonebridge. Wagner was found here, then? Right here. Who found him? Mother Smith. She came over early, and the sight made her scream. The women all came running. Mother Smith had to be put to bed. Who found Mary? See here, Joe, I told you all I knowed once before, replied the Mormon testily. I forgotten, was sort of bewildered. Tell me again. Who found her? The women folks. She laid right inside the door in a dead faint. She hadn't undressed. There was blood on her hands and a cut or scratch. The women fetched her too, but she wouldn't talk. Then Elder Smith came and took her 
They've got her locked up. Then Joe led Shefford away from the cabin, farther on into the village. When they were halted by the somber, grieving women, it was Joe who did the talking. They passed the schoolhouse, and here Shefford quickened his step. He could scarcely bear the feeling that rushed over him, and the Mormon gripped his arm as if he understood. Shefford, which one of these younger women do you reckon your best friend, Ruth? asked Lake earnestly. Ruth, by all means. Just lately I haven't seen her often, but we've been close friends. I think she'd do much for me. Maybe there'll be a chance to find out. Maybe we'll need Ruth. Let's have a word with her. I haven't seen her out among the women. They stopped at the door of Ruth's cabin. It was closed. When Joe knocked, there came a sound of footsteps inside. A hand drew aside the window blind, and presently the door opened. Ruth stood there, dressed in somber hue. She was a pretty, slender, blue-eyed, brown-haired young woman. Shefford imagined from her pallor and the set look of shock upon her face that the tragedy had affected her more powerfully than it had the other women. When he remembered that she had been more friendly with Fay Larkin than any other neighbor, he made sure he was right in his conjecture. Come in, was Ruth's greeting. No, we just wanted to say a word. I noticed you've not been out. Do you know all about it? She gave them a strange glance. Any of the women folk been in? asked Joe. Hester ran over. She told me through the window. Then I barred my door to keep the other women out. What for? asked Joe curiously. Please come in, she said in reply. They entered. She closed the door after them. The change that came over her then was the loosening of restraint. Joe, what will they do with Mary? she queried tensely. The Mormon studied her with dark, speculative eyes. Hang her, he replied, in brutal harshness. Oh, mother of saints, she cried, and her hands went up. You're sorry for Mary then? asked Joe bluntly. My heart is breaking for her. Well, so's Shefford's, said the Mormon huskily, and mine's kind of damn shaky. Ruth glided to Shefford with a woman's swift softness. You've been my good, my best friend. You were hers, too. Oh, I know. Can't you do something for her? I hope to God I can, replied Shefford. Then the three stood looking from one to the other, in a strong, and subtly realizing moment drawn together. Ruth whispered Joe hoarsely, and then he glanced fearfully around at the window and door as if listeners were there. It was certain that his dark face had paled. He tried to whisper more, only to fail. Shefford divined the weight of Mormonism that burdened Joe Lake then. Joe was faithful to a love for Fay Larkin noble in his friendship to Shefford, desperate in a bitter strait with his own manliness. But the power of that creed by which he had been raised struck his lips mute. For to speak on meant to be false to that creed. Already in his heart he had decided, yet he could not voice the thing. Ruth, Shefford took up the Mormon's unfinished whisper. If we plan to save her, if we need you, will you help? Ruth turned white, but an instant and splendid fire shone in her eyes. Try me, she whispered back. I'll change places with her so you can get her away. They can't do much to me. Shefford wrung her hands. Joe licked his lips and found his voice. We'll come back later. Then he led the way out, and Shefford followed. They were silent all the way back to camp. Nas Te Bega sat in repose where they had left him, a thoughtful, somber figure. Shefford went directly to the Indian, and Joe tarried at the campfire, where he raked out some red embers and put one upon the bowl of his pipe. He puffed clouds of white smoke, then found a seat beside the others. Shefford, go ahead, talk. It'll take a deal of talk. I'll listen. Then I'll talk. It'll be Nas Te Bega who makes the plan out of it all. 
Shefford launched himself so swiftly that he scarcely talked coherently. But he made clear the points that he must save Fay, get her away from the village, let her lead him to Surprise Valley, rescue Lassiter and Jane Witherstein, and take them all out of the country. Joe Lake dubiously shook his head. Manifestly, the Surprise Valley part of the situation presented a new and serious obstacle. It changed the whole thing. To try to take the three out by way of Cayenta and Durango was not to be thought of, for reasons he briefly stated. The Red Lake Trail was the only one left, and if that were taken, the chances were against Shefford. It was five days over sand to Red Lake, impossible to hide a trail, and even with a day's start, Shefford could not escape the hard-riding men who had come from Stonebridge. Besides, after reaching Red Lake, there were days and days of desert travel needful to avoid places like Blue Canyon, Tuba, Moenkopi, and the Indian villages. We'll have to risk all that, declared Shefford desperately. It's a fool risk, retorted Joe. Listen, by tomorrow noon, all of Stonebridge, more or less, will be riding in here. You've got to get away tonight with the girl or never, and tomorrow you've got to find that Lassiter and the woman in Surprise Valley. This valley must be back deep in the canyon country. Well, you've got to come out this way again. No trail through here would be safe. Why, you'd put all your heads in a rope. You mustn't come through this way. It'll have to be tried across country, off trails, and that means hell, day and night travel, no camp, no feed for horses, maybe no water. Then you'll have the best trackers in Utah like hounds on your trail. When the Mormon ceased his forceful speech, there was a silence fraught with hopeless meaning. He bowed his head in gloom. Shefford, growing sick again to his marrow, fought a cold, hateful sense of despair. By nigh, in his extremity, he called to the Indian. The Navajo has heard, replied Nas Te Bega, strangely speaking in his own language. With a long, slow heave of breast, Shefford felt his despair leave him. In the Indian lay his salvation. He knew it. Joe Lake caught the subtle spirit of the moment and looked up eagerly. End of Chapter 15 Part 1「Part Two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wild Justice, Part Two. Naste Bega stretched an arm toward the east and spoke in Navajo, but Shefford, owing to the hurry and excitement of his mind, could not translate. Joe listened, gave a violent start, leaped up with all his big frame quivering and then fired question after question at the Indian. When the Navajo had replied to all, Joe drew himself up as if facing an irrevocable decision which would wring his very soul. What did he cast off in that moment? What did he grapple with? Shefford had no means to tell, except by the instinct which baffled him. But whether the Mormon's trial was one of spiritual rending, or the natural physical fear of a perilous, virtually impossible venture, the fact was, he was magnificent in his acceptance of it. He turned to Shefford, white, cold, yet glowing. Naste Bega believes he can take you down a canyon to the big river, the Colorado. He knows the head of this canyon. Nanesoche Boko, it's called, Canyon of the Rainbow Bridge. He has never been down it. Only two or three living Indians had ever seen the great stone bridge, but all have heard of it. They worship it as a god. There's water runs down this canyon, and water runs to the river. Naste Bega thinks he can take you down to the river. Go on, cried Shefford breathlessly, as Joe paused. The Indian plans this way. God, it's great. 
if only I can do my end. He plans to take Mustangs today and wait with them for you tonight or tomorrow till you come with the girl. You'll go get Lassiter and the woman out of Surprise Valley. Then you'll strike east for None Soche Boco. If possible, you must take a pack of grub. You may be days going down and waiting for me at the mouth of the canyon at the river. Joe, where will you be? I'll ride like hell for Cayenta, get another horse there, and ride like hell for the San Juan River. There's a big flat boat at the Durango crossing. I'll go down the San Juan and that, into the big river. I'll drift down by day, tie up by night, and watch for you at the mouth of every canyon till I come to Nanoche Boco. Shefford could not believe the evidence of his ears. He knew the treacherous San Juan River. He had heard of the great, sweeping, terrible Red Colorado and its roaring rapids. Oh, it seems impossible, he gasped. You'll just lose your life for nothing. The Indian will turn the trick, I tell you. Take my hunch. It's nothing for me to drift down a swift river. I worked a ferry boat once. Shefford, to whom flying straws would have seemed stable, caught the inflection of defiance and daring and hope of the Mormon spirit. What then, after you meet us at the mouth of the Nanesoshi Boko, he queried? We'll all drift down to Lee's Ferry. That's at the head of Marble Canyon. We'll get out on the south side of the river, thus avoiding any Mormons at the ferry. Naste Bega knows the country. It's open desert on the other side of these plateaus. He can get horses from Navajos. Then you'll strike south for Willow Springs. Willow Springs? That's Presby's trading post, said Shefford. Never met him, but he'll see you safe out of the painted desert. The thing that worries me most is how not to miss you all at the mouth of None Shoshi. You must have sharp eyes, but I forget the Indian. A bird couldn't pass him. And suppose Nane Shoshe Boko has a steep-walled, narrow mouth opening into rapids. Well, well, the Indian will figure that, too. Now let's put our heads together and plan how to turn this end of the trick here. Getting the girl. After a short colloquy, it was arranged that Shefford would go to Ruth and talk to her of the aid she had promised. Joe averred that this aid could be best given by Ruth going in her somber gown and hood to the schoolhouse, and there, while Joe and Shefford engaged the guard outside, she would change apparel and places with Fay, and let her come forth. "'What will they do to Ruth?' demanded Shefford. "'We can't accept her sacrifice if she's to suffer or to be punished.' "'Reckon Ruth has a strong hunch that she can get away with it. Did you notice how strange she said that? Well, they can't do much to her. The bishop may damn her soul, but Ruth... Here Lake hesitated and broke off. Not improbably, he had meant to say that of all the Mormon women in the valley, Ruth was the least likely to suffer from punishment inflicted upon her soul. Anyway, it's our only chance, went on Joe, unless we kill a couple of men. Ruth will gladly take what comes to help you. All right, I consent, replied Shefford with emotion. And now, after she comes out, the supposed Ruth, what then? You can be natural-like. Go with her back to Ruth's cabin. Then stroll off into the cedars. Then climb the west wall. Meanwhile, Nas Bega will ride off with a pack of grub and knack and several other mustangs. He'll wait for you, or you'll wait for him, as the case may be, at some appointed place. When you're gone, I'll jump my horse and hit the trail for Cayenta and the San Juan. Very well, that's settled, said Shefford soberly. I'll go at once to see Ruth. You and Naste Bega decide on where I'm to meet him. Reckon you'd do just as well to walk round and come up the roofs from the other side, instead of going through the village, suggested Joe. Shefford approached Ruth's cabin in a roundabout way. Nevertheless, she saw him coming, before he got there, and, opening the door, 
stood pale, composed, and quietly bade him enter. Briefly, in low and earnest voice, Shefford acquainted her with the plan. "'You love her so much,' she said wistfully, wonderingly. "'Indeed I do. Is it too much to ask of you to do this thing?' he asked. "'Do it?' she queried, with a flash of spirit. "'Of course I'll do it.' "'Ruth, I can't thank you. I can't. I've only a faint idea what you're risking. That distresses me. I'm afraid of what may happen to you.' She gave him another of the strange glances. "'I don't risk so much as you think,' she said significantly. "'Why?' She came close to him, and her hands clasped his arms, and she looked up at him, her eyes darkening and her face growing paler. "'Will you swear to keep my secret?' she asked very low. "'Yes, I swear. I was one of Wagner's sealed wives.' "'God Almighty!' broke out Shefford, utterly overwhelmed. "'Yes, that's why I say I don't risk so much.' I will make up a story to tell the bishop and everybody. I'll tell that Wagoner was jealous, that he was brutal to Mary, that I believed she was goaded to her mad deed, that I thought she ought to be free. They'll be terrible, but what can they do to me? My husband is dead, and if I have to go to hell to keep from marrying another married Mormon, I'll go. In that low, passionate utterance, Shefford read, the death blow to the old Mormon polygamous creed. In the uplift of his spirit, in the joy at this revelation, he almost forgot the stern matter at hand. Ruth and Joe Lake belonged to a younger generation of Mormons. Their nobility in this instance was in part a revolt at the conditions of their lives. Doubt was knocking at Joe Lake's heart. A conviction had come to this young sealed wife. Bitter, and hopeless while she had been fettered, strong and mounting now that she was free. In a flash of inspiration, Shefford saw the old order changing. The Mormon creed might survive, but that part of it which was an affront to nature, a horrible yoke on women's necks, was doomed. It could not live. It could never have survived more than a generation or two of religious fanatics. Shefford had marked a different force and religious fervor in the younger Mormons, and now he understood them. "'Ruth, you talk wildly,' he said, "'but I understand, I see. You are free, and you're going to stay free. It stuns me to think of that man of many wives. What did you feel when you were told he was dead?' "'I dare not think of that. It makes me wicked, and he was good to me. Listen.' Last night about midnight he came to my window and woke me. I got up and let him in. He was in a terrible state. I thought he was crazy. He walked the floor and called on his saints and prayed. When I wanted to light a lamp, he wouldn't let me. He was afraid I'd see his face. But I saw well enough in the moonlight, and I knew something had happened. So I soothed and coaxed him. He had been a man as close-mouthed as a stone, yet... Then I got him to talk. He had gone to Mary's, and upon entering, thought he heard someone with her. She didn't answer him at first. When he found her in her bedroom, she was like a ghost. He accused her. Her silence made him furious. Then he berated her, brought down the wrath of God upon her, threatened her with damnation. All of which she never seemed to hear. But when he tried to touch her, she flew at him like a she-panther. That's what he called her. She said she'd kill him, and she drove him out of her house. He was all weak and unstrung, and I believe scared, too, when he came to me. She must have been a fury. Those quiet, gentle women are furies when they're once roused. Well, I was hours up with him, and finally he got over it. He didn't pray any more. He paced the room. It was just daybreak when he said the wrath of God had come to him. I tried to keep him from going back to Mary, but he went. An hour later, the woman ran to tell me he had been found dead at Mary's door. Ruth, she was mad, driven. She didn't know what she was doing, said Shefford brokenly. She was always a strange girl. 
more like an Indian than any one I ever knew. We called her the Sago Lily. I gave her the name. She was so sweet, lovely, white and gold, like those flowers. And to think, oh, it's horrible for her. You must save her. If you get her away, there never will be anything come of it. The Mormons will hush it up. Ruth, time is flying, rejoined Shefford hurriedly. I must go back to Joe. You be ready for us when we come. Wear something loose, easily thrown off, and don't forget the long hood. I'll be ready and watching, she said. The sooner the better, I say. He left her and returned toward camp in the same circling route by which he had come. The Indian had disappeared, and so had his mustang. This significant fact augmented Shefford's hurried, thrilling excitement. But one glance at Joe's face changed all that to a sudden numbness, a sinking of his heart. What is it? he queried. Look there, exclaimed the Mormon. Shefford's quick eye caught sight of horses and men down the valley. He saw several Indians and three or four white men. They were making camp. Who are they? demanded Shefford. Shad and some of his gang reckon that Paiute told the news. By tomorrow, the valley will be full as a horse wrangler's corral. Lucky Nas Te Bega got away before that gang rode in. Now things won't look as queer as they might have looked. The Indian took a pack of grub, six mustangs, and my guns. Then there was your rifle and your saddle sheath. So you'll be well healed in case you come to close quarters. Reckon you can look for a running fight. For now, as soon as your flight is discovered, Shad will hit your trail. He's in with the Mormons, you know him, and what you have to deal with. But the advantage will be all yours. You can ambush the trail. We're in for it, and the sooner we're off the better, replied Shefford grimly. Reckon that's gospel. Well, come on. The Mormon strode off, and Shefford, catching up with him, kept at his side. Shefford's mind was full, but Joe's dark and gloomy face did not invite communication. They entered the pinion grove and passed the cabin where the tragedy had been enacted. A tarpaulin had been stretched across the front porch. Beale was not in sight, nor were any of the women. I forgot, said Shefford suddenly. Where am I to meet the Indian? Climb the west wall, back of camp, replied Joe. Nas Te Bega took the stone bridge trail. But he'll leave that, climb the rocks, then hide the outfit and come back to watch for you. Reckon he'll see you when you top the wall. They passed on into the heart of the village. Joe tarried at the window of the cabin and passed a few remarks to a woman there. And then he inquired for Mother Smith at her house. When they left here, the Mormon gave Shefford a nudge. Then they separated, Joe going toward the schoolhouse, while Shefford bent his steps in the direction of Ruth's home. Her door opened before he had a chance to knock. He entered. Ruth, white and resolute, greeted him with a wistful smile. Already, she asked. Yes, are you? He replied, low-voiced. I've only to put on my hood. I think luck favors you. Hester was here, and she said Elder Smith told someone that Mary hadn't been offered anything to eat yet, so I'm taking her a little. It'll be a good excuse for me to get in the schoolhouse to see her. I can throw off this dress, and she could put it on in a minute. Then the hood. I mustn't forget to hide her golden hair. You know how it flies. But this is a big hood. Well... I'm ready now, and this is our last time together. Ruth, what can I say? How can I thank you? I don't want any thanks. It'll be something to think of always, to make me happy. Only, I'd like to feel you, you cared a little. The wistful smile was there, a tremor on the sad lips, and a shadow of soul hunger in her eyes. Shefford did not misunderstand her. She did not mean love, although it was a yearning for real love that she mutely expressed. Care? I shall care all my life, he said, with strong feeling. 
I shall never forget you. It's not likely I'll forget you. Goodbye, John. Shefford took her in his arms and held her close. Ruth, goodbye, he said huskily. Then he released her. She adjusted the hood and, taking up a little tray which held food covered with a napkin, she turned to the door. He opened it and they went out. They did not speak another word. It was not a long walk from Ruth's house to the schoolhouse, yet if it were being measured by Shefford's emotion, the distance would have been unending. The sacrifice offered by Ruth and Joe would have been noble under any circumstances had they been Gentiles or persons with no particular religion. But considering that they were Mormons, that Ruth had been a sealed wife, that Joe had been brought up under the strange secret and binding creed, their action was no less than tremendous in its import. Shefford took it to mean vastly more than loyalty to him and pity for Fay Larkin. As Ruth and Joe had arisen to this height, so perhaps would other young Mormons have arisen. It needed only the situation, the climax, to focus these long insulated, slow developing and inquiring minds upon the truth that one wife, one mother of children, for one man at one time, was a law of nature, love, and righteousness. Shefford felt as if he were marching with the whole younger generation of Mormons, as if somehow he had been a humble instrument in the working out of their destiny, in the awakening that was to eliminate from their religion the only thing which kept it from being as good for man and perhaps as true as any other religion. And then suddenly he turned the corner of the schoolhouse to encounter Joe talking with the Mormon Henniger. Elder Smith was not present. Why, hello, Ruth, greeted Joe. You fetched Mary some dinner. Now that's good of you. May I go in, asked Ruth. Reckon so, replied Henniger, scratching his head. He appeared to be tractable and probably was good-natured under pleasant conditions. She ought to have something to eat, and nobody appears to have remembered that. We're so set up. He unbarred the huge, clumsy door and allowed Ruth to pass in. Joe, you can go in if you want, he said, but hurry out before Elder Smith comes back from his dinner. Joe mumbled something, gave a husky cough, and then went in. Shefford experienced great difficulty in presenting to this mild Mormon a natural and unagitated front. When all his internal structure seemed to be in a state of turmoil, he did not see how it was possible to keep the fact from showing in his face. So he turned away and took aimless steps here and there. "'Pears like we're having rain,' observed Henniger. "'It's right warm, and them clouds are unseasonable.' "'Yes,' replied Shefford. "'Hope so. A little rain would be good for the grass. Joe tells me Shad rode in and some of his fellows. So I see, about eight in the party. Shefford was gritting his teeth and preparing to endure the ordeal of controlling his mind and expression when the door opened and Joe stalked out. He had his sombrero pulled down so that it hid the upper half of his face. His lips were a shade off healthy color. He stood there with his back to the door. "'Say what Mary needs is quiet to be left alone,' he said. "'Ruth says if she rests, sleeps a little, she won't get fever. Henniger, don't let anybody disturb her till night.' "'All right, Joe,' replied the Mormon. "'And I take it good of Ruth and you to concern yourself.' A slight tap on the inside of the door sent Shefford's pulses to throbbing. Joe opened it with a strong and vigorous sweep that meant more than the mere action. Ruth, reckon you didn't stay long, he said, and his voice rang clear. Sure you feel sick and weak. Why, seeing her flustered even me. A slender, dark-garbed woman wearing a long black hood stepped uncertainly out. She appeared to be Ruth. Shefford's heart stood still because she looked so like Ruth, but she did not step steadily. 
She seemed dazed. She did not raise the hooded head. Go home, said Joe, and his voice rang a little louder. Take her home, Shepherd, or better, walk her round some. She's faintish. And see here, Henniger. Shefford led the girl away with a hand, in apparent carelessness, on her arm. After a few rods, she walked with a freer step, and then a swifter. He found it necessary to make the hold on her arm a real one, so as to keep her from walking too fast. No one, however, appeared to observe them. When they passed Ruth's house then, Shefford began to lose his fear that this was not Fay Larkin. He was far from being calm or clear-sighted. He thought he recognized that free step. Nevertheless, he could not make sure. When they passed under the trees, crossed the brook, and turned down along the west wall, then doubt ceased in Shefford's mind. He knew this was not Ruth. Still so strange was his agitation, so keen his suspense, that he needed confirmation of ear, of eye. He wanted to hear her voice, to see her face. Yet, just as strangely, there was a twist of feeling, a reluctance, a sadness that kept off the moment. They reached the low, slow, swelling slant of wall, and started to ascend. How impossible not to recognize Fay Larkin now, in that swift grace and skill on the steep wall. Still, though he knew her, he perversely clung to the unreality of the moment. But when a long braid of dead gold hair tumbled from under the hood, then his heart leaped. That identified Fay Larkin. He had freed her. He was taking her away. Then a sadness embittered his joy. As always before, she distanced him in the ascent to the top. She went on without looking back but Shefford had an irresistible desire to look again, and the last time, at this valley where he had suffered and loved so much. End of Chapter 15, Part 2《Steen of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Surprise Valley. From the summit of the wall the plateau waved away in red and yellow ridges, with here and there little valleys green with cedar and pinyon. Upon one of these ridges, silhouetted against the sky, appeared the stalking figure of the Indian. He had espied the fugitives. He disappeared in a niche, and presently came again into view, round a corner of cliff. Here he waited, and soon Shefford and Fay joined him. By nigh, it is well, he said. Shefford eagerly asked for the horses, and Nas Te Bega silently pointed down the niche, which was evidently an opening into one of the shallow canyon. Then he led the way, walking swiftly. It was Shefford, and not Fay, who had difficulty in keeping close to him. This speed caused Shefford to become more alive to the business, instead of the feeling of the flight. The Indian entered a crack between low cliffs, a very narrow canyon full of rocks and clumps of cedar, and in half an hour or less he came to where the mustangs were halted among some cedars. Three of the mustangs, including Nack Yaw, were saddled. One bore a small pack, and the remaining two had blankets strapped on their backs. Fay, can you ride in that long skirt? asked Shefford. How strange it seemed that his first words to her were practical when all his impassioned thought had been only mute. But the instant he spoke, he experienced a relief, a relaxation. I'll take it off, replied Fay, just as practically, and in a twinkling she slipped out of both waist and skirt. She had worn them over the short white flannel dress with which Shefford had grown familiar. As Nack Yaw appeared to be the safest mustang for her to ride, Shefford helped her upon him, and then attended to the stirrups. When he had adjusted them to the proper length, he drew the bridle over Nack Yaw's head and, upon handing it to her, 
found himself suddenly looking into her face. She had taken off the hood, too. The instant their eyes met, he realized that she was strangely afraid to meet his glance, as he was to meet hers. That seemed natural, but her face was flushed, and there were unmistakable signs upon it of growing excitement, of mounting happiness. Save for that fugitive glance, she would have been the Fay Larkin of yesterday. How had he expected her to look, he did not know, but it was not like this, and never had he felt her strange quality of simplicity so powerfully. "'Have you ever been here, through this little canyon?' he asked. "'Oh, yes, lots of times. You'll be able to lead us to Surprise Valley, you think?' "'I know it. I shall see Uncle Jim and Mother Jane before sunset.' "'I hope you do,' he replied a little shakily. "'Perhaps we'd better not tell them of the—about what happened last night.' Her beautiful, grave, and troubled glance returned to meet his, and he received a shock that he considered was a maze. After a more swift consideration, he believed he was amazed because that look, instead of betraying fear or gloom or any haunting shadow of darkness, betrayed apprehension for him, grave, sweet, troubled love for him. She was not thinking of herself at all, of what he might think of her, of a possible gulf between them, of a vast and terrible change in the relation of soul to soul. He experienced a profound gladness. Though he could not understand her, he was happy that the horror of Wagner's death had escaped her. He loved her. He meant to give his life to her, and right then and there he accepted the burden of her deed, and meant to bear it without ever letting her know of the shadow between them. Fay, we'll forget what's behind us, he said. Now to find Surprise Valley. Lead on. Knack yaw's gentle. Pull him the way you want to go. We'll follow. Shefford mounted the other saddled Mustang, and they set off. Fay in advance. Presently, they rode out of this canyon up to level cedar-patched solid rock, and here Fay turned straight west. Evidently, she had been over the ground before. The heights to which he had climbed with her were up to the left, great slopes and looming promontories, and the course she chose was as level and easy as any he could have picked out in that direction. When a mile or more of this up and down travel had been traversed, Fay halted and appeared to be at fault. The plateau was losing its rounded, smooth, wavy characteristics, and to the west grew bolder, more rugged, more cut up in low crags and buttes. After a long sweeping glance, Fay headed straight for this rougher country. Thereafter, from time to time, she repeated this action. Fay, how do you know you're going in the right direction? asked Shefford anxiously. I never forget any ground I've been over. I keep my eyes close ahead. All that seems strange to me is the wrong way. What I've seen before must be the right way because I saw it when they brought me from Surprise Valley. Shefford had to acknowledge that she was following an Indian's instinct for ground he had once covered. Still, Shefford began to worry, and finally dropped back to question Nas Te Bega. By an eye, she has the eye of a Navajo, replied the Indian. Look, iron-shod horses have passed here. See the marks in the stone? Shefford, indeed, made out faint cut tracks that would have escaped his own sight. They had been made long ago, but they were unmistakable. She's following the trail by memory. She must remember the stones, trees, sage, cactus, said Shefford, in surprise. Pictures in her mind, replied the Indian. Thereafter, the farther she progressed, the less at fault she appeared and the faster she traveled. She made several miles an hour, and about the middle of the afternoon entered upon the more broken region of the plateau. View became restricted. Low walls and rune cliffs of red rock with cedars at their base, and gullies growing into canyon and canyon opening up into larger ones. These were passed and crossed and climbed, and rimmed in travel that grew more difficult 
as the going became wilder. There was a steady ascent, up and up all the time, though not steep, until another level, green with cedar and pinyon, was reached. It reminded Shefford of the forest near the mouth of the Sagi. It was so dense he could not see far ahead of Fay, and often he lost sight of her entirely. Presently he rode out of the forest, into a strip of purple sage. It ended abruptly, and above that abrupt line, seemingly far away, rose a long red wall. Instantly he recognized that to be the opposite wall of a canyon which as yet he could not see. Fay was acting strangely, and he hurried forward. She slipped off Nack Yaw and fell, sprang up, and ran wildly to stand upon a promontory, her arms uplifted, her hair a mass of moving gold in the wind, her attitude one of wild and eloquent significance. Shefford ran, too, and as he ran, the red walls in his eager sight seemed to enlarge downward, deeper and deeper, and then it merged into a strip of green. Suddenly beneath him yawned a red-walled gulf, a deceiving gulf seen through transparent haze, a softly shining green and white valley, strange, wild, beautiful, like the picture in his memory. Surprise Valley, he cried, in wondering recognition. Fay Larkin waved her arms as if they were wings to carry her swiftly downward, and her plaintive cry fitted the wildness of her manner and the lonely height where she leaned. Shefford drew her back from the rim. Fay, we are here, he said. I recognize the valley. I miss only one thing, the arch of stone. His words seemed to recall her to reality. The arch that fell when the wall slipped in the great avalanche. See, there is the place. We can get down there. Oh, let us hurry. The Indian reached the rim, and his falcon gaze swept the valley. Ugh, he exclaimed. He too recognized the valley that he had vainly sought for half a year. Bring the lassos, said Shefford. With Fay leading, they followed the rim toward the head of the valley. Here the wall had caved in, and there was a slope of jumbled rock a thousand feet wide, and more than that in depth. It was easy to descend, because there were so many rocks waist-high that afforded a handhold. Shefford marked, however, that Fay never took advantage of these. More than once he paused to watch her. Swiftly she went down. She stepped from rock to rock. Lightly, she crossed cracks and pits. She ran along the sharp and broken edge of a long ledge. She poised on a pointed stone, and, sure-footed as a mountain sheep, she sprang to another that had scarce surface for foothold. Her moccasins flashed, seemed to hold wondrously on any angle, and when a rock tipped or slipped with her, she leaped to a surer stand. Shefford watched her performance, so swift, agile, so perfectly balanced, showing such wonderful accord between eye and foot, and then, when his gaze swept down upon that wild valley where she had roamed alone for twelve years, he marveled no more. The farther down he got, the greater became the size of rocks, until he found himself amid huge pieces of cliff as large as houses. He lost sight of Fay entirely, and he anxiously threaded a narrow, winding, descending way between the broken masses. Finally he came out upon flat rock again. Fay stood on another rim, looking down. He saw that the slide had moved far out into the valley, and the lower part of it consisted of great sections of wall. In fact, the base of the great wall had just moved out with the avalanche and this much of it held its vertical position. Looking upward, Shefford was astounded and thrilled to see how far he had descended, how the walls leaned like a great, wide, curving, continuous rim of mountain. "'Here, here,' called Fay. "'Here's where they got down, where they brought me up. Here are the sticks they used. They stuck him in this crack, down to that ledge.' Shefford ran to her side and looked down. There was a narrow split 
in this section of wall, and it was perhaps sixty feet in depth. The floor of rock below led out in a ledge, with a sheer drop to the valley level. As Shefford gazed, pondering on a way to descend lower, the Indian reached his side. He had no sooner looked than he proceeded to act. Selecting one of the sticks, which were strong pieces of cedar, well hewn and trimmed, he jammed it between the walls of the crack till it stuck fast. Then, sitting astride this one, he jammed in another some three feet below. When he got down upon that one, it was necessary for Shefford to drop him a third stick. In a comparatively short time, the Indian reached the ledge below. Then he called for the lassos. Shefford threw them down. His next move was an attempt to assist Fay, but she slipped out of his grasp and descended the ladder with a swiftness that made him hold his breath. Still, when his turn came, her spirit so governed him that he went down as swiftly and even leaped sheer the last ten feet. Nas Te Beg and Fay were leaning over the ledge. Here's the place, she said excitedly. Let me down on the rope. It took two thirty-foot lassos tied together to reach the floor of the valley. Shefford folded his vest, put it round Fay, and slipped the loop of the lasso under her arms. Then he and Nas Te Bega lowered her to the grass below. Fay, throwing off the loop, bounded away like a wild creature, uttering the strangest cries he had ever heard, and she disappeared along the wall. I'll go down, said Shefford to the Indian. You stay here to help pull us up. Hand over hand, Shefford descended, and when his feet touched the grass, he experienced a shock of the most singular exaltation. In Surprise Valley, he breathed softly. The dream that had come to him with his friend's story, the years of waiting, wondering, and then the long, fruitless, hopeless search in the desert uplands. These were in his mind as he turned along the wall where Fay had disappeared. He faced a wide terrace, green with grass and moss, and starry with strange white flowers, and dark foliage, spear-pointed spruce trees. Below the terrace sloped a bench, covered with thick copse, and this merged into a forest of dwarf oaks, and beyond that was a beautiful strip of white aspens, their leaves quivering in the stillness. The air was close, sweet, warm, fragrant, and remarkably dry. It reminded him of the air he had smelled in dry caves under cliffs. He reached the point from where he saw a meadow dotted with red and white spotted cattle and little black burrows. There were many of them, and he remembered with a start the agony of toil and peril Venters had endured bringing the progenitors of this stock into the valley. What a strange, wild, beautiful story it all was. But a story connected with this valley could not have been otherwise. Beyond the meadow on the other side of the valley extended the forest, and that ended in the rising bench of thicket, which gave place to green slope and mossy terrace of sharp-tipped spruces and all this led the eye irresistibly up to the red wall where a vast, dark, wonderful cavern yawned, with its rust-colored streaks of stain on the wall. And the queer little houses of the cliff-dwellers, with their black, vacant, silent windows, speaking so weirdly of the unknown past. Shefford passed a place where the ground had been cultivated, but not as recently as the last six months. There was a scant shock of corn and many meager standing stalks. He became aware of a low, whining hum and a fragrance overpowering in its sweetness. And there, round another corner of wall, he came upon an orchard all pink and white in blossoms and melodious with the buzz and hum of innumerable bees. He crossed a little stream that had been dammed, went along a pond, down beside an irrigation ditch that furnished water to orchard and vineyard, and from there he strode into a beautiful cove between two jutting corners of red wall. It was level and green, and the spruces stood gracefully everywhere. Beyond their dark trunks 
he saw caves in the wall. Suddenly the fragrance of blossoms was overwhelmed by the stronger fragrance of smoke from a wood fire. Swiftly he strode under the spruces. Quail fluttered before him as tame as chickens. Big gray rabbits scarcely moved out of his way. The branches above him were full of mockingbirds, and then, there before him, stood three figures. Fay Larkin was held close to the side of a magnificent woman, barbarously clad in garments made of skins and pieces of blanket. Her face worked in noble emotion. Shefford seemed to see the ghost of that fair beauty, Venters had said, was Jane Witherstein's. Her hair was gray. Near her stood a lean, stoop-shouldered man whose long hair was perfectly white. His gaunt face was bare of beard. It had strange, sloping, sad lines, and he was staring with mild, surprised eyes. The moment held Shefford mute till sight of Fay Larkin's tear-wet face broke the spell. He leaped forward, and his strong hands reached for the woman and the man. Jane Witherstein, Lassiter, I have found you. Oh, sir, who are you? she cried, with rich and deep and quivering voice. This child came running, screaming. She could not speak. We thought she had gone mad and escaped to come back to us. I am John Shefford, he replied swiftly. I am a friend of Byrne Venters, of his wife Bess. I learned your story. I came west. I searched a year. I found Fay, and we've come to take you away. You found Fay? But that masked Mormon who forced her to sacrifice herself to save us. What of him? It's not been so many long years. I remember what my father was, and Dyer and Tull, and all those cruel churchmen. Wagoner is dead, replied Shefford. Dead? She is free. Oh, what? How did he die? He was killed. Who did it? That's no matter, replied Shefford stonily, and he met her gaze with steady eyes. He's out of the way. Fay was never his wife. Fay's free. We've come to take you out of the country. We must hurry. We'll be tracked, pursued. But we've horses and an Indian guide. We'll get away. I think it better to leave here at once. There's no telling how soon we'll be hunted. Get what things you want to take with you. Oh, yes, Mother Jane, let us hurry, cried Fay. I'm so full, I can't talk. My heart hurts so. Jane Witherstein's face shone with an exceedingly radiant light, and a glory blended with a terrible fear in her eyes. Fay, my little Fay. Lassiter had stood there with his mild, clear blue eyes upon Shefford. I'm sure glad to see you all, he drawled, and extended his hand as if the meeting were casual. What'd you say your name was? Shefford repeated it as he met the proffered hand. How's Byrne and Bess? Lassiter inquired. They were well, prosperous, happy when I last saw them. They had a baby. Now ain't that fine. Jane, did you hear? Bess had a baby. And Jane, didn't I always say Byrne would come back to get us out? Sure, it's just the same. How cool, easy, slow, and mild this Lassiter seemed. Had the man grown old, Shefford wondered, the past to him, manifestly, was only yesterday, and the dangers of the present was as nothing. Looking in Lassiter's face, Shefford was baffled. If he had not remembered the greatness of this old gunman, he might have believed that the lonely years in the valley had unbalanced his mind. In an hour like this, coolness seemed inexplicable, assuredly would have been impossible in an ordinary man. Yet what hid behind that drawing coolness? What was the meaning of those long, sloping, shadowy lines of face? What spirit lay in the deep, mild, clear eyes? Shefford experienced a sudden check to what had been his first growing impression of a drifting, broken old man. Lassiter, pack what little you can carry, mustn't be much, and we'll get out of here, said Shefford. I sure will. Reckon I ain't going to need a pack train. We saved the clothes we wore in here. Jane never thought it no use. 
but I figured we might need them some day. They won't be stylish, but I reckon they'll do better than these skins. And there's an old coat that was Venter's. The mild, dreamy look became intensified in Lassiter's eyes. Did Venters have any horses when you knowed him? he asked. He had a farm full of horses, replied Shefford with a smile. And there were two blacks, the grandest horses I ever saw, Black Star and Knight. You remember, Lassiter? Sure, I was wondering if you got the blacks out. They must be growing old by now. Grand horses they was. But Jane had another horse, a big devil of a sorrel. His name was Wrangle. Did Venters ever tell you about him? And that race with Jerry Card. A hundred times, replied Shefford. Wrangle run the blacks off their legs. But Jane never would believe that, and I couldn't change her all these years. Reckon maybe we'll get to see them blacks. Indeed, I hope. I believe you will, replied Shefford, feelingly. Sure won't that be fine. Jane, did you hear? Black Star and Knight are living, and we'll get to see them. But Jane Witherstein only clasped Fay in her arms, and looked at Lassiter with wet and glistening eyes. Shefford told them to hurry and come to the cliff where the ascent from the valley was to be made. He thought best to leave them alone to make their preparations and bid farewell to the cavern home they had known for so long. Then he strode back along the wall, loitering here to gaze into a cave, and there to study crude red paintings in the nooks. And sometimes he halted thoughtfully, and did not see anything. At last he rounded a corner of cliff to espy Nas Te Bega sitting upon the ledge, reposeful and watchful as usual. Shefford told the Indian they would be climbing out soon, and then he sat down to wait and let his gaze rove over the valley. He might have sat there a long while, so sad and reflective and wondering was his thought, but it seemed a very short time till Fay came in sight with her free, swift grace, and Lassiter and Jane some distance behind. Jane carried a small bundle, and Lassiter had a sack over his shoulder that appeared no inconsiderable burden. Them beans are sure heavy, he drawled, as he deposited the sack upon the ground. Shefford curiously took hold of the sack, and was amazed to find that a second and hard muscular effort was required to lift it. Beans, he queried. Sure, replied Lassiter. That's the heaviest sack of beans I ever saw. Why, it's not possible it can be. Lassiter, we've a long, rough trail. We've got the pack light. Well, I ain't going to leave this sack here behind. Reckon I've been all of twelve years in filling it, he declared mildly. Shefford could only stare at him. Fay may need them beans, went on Lassiter. Why? Because they're gold. Gold, ejaculated Shefford. Sure, and they represent some work. Twelve years of digging and washing. Shefford laughed constrainedly. Well, Lassiter, that alters the case considerably. A sack of gold nuggets or grains or beans, as you call them, certainly must not be left behind. Come now, we'll tackle this climbing job. He called up to the Indian and, grasping the rope, began to walk up the first slant, and then by dint of hand-over-hand -hand effort and climbing with knees and feet, he succeeded, with Nas Te Bega's help, in making the ledge. Then he let down the rope to haul up the sack and bundle. That done, he directed Fay to fasten the noose round her as he had fixed it before. When she complied, he called to her to hold herself out from the wall while he and Nas Te Bega hauled her up. Hold the rope tight, replied Fay. I'll walk up. And to Shefford's amaze and admiration, she virtually walked up that almost perpendicular wall by slipping her hands along the rope and stepping as she pulled herself up. There, if never before, he saw the fruit of her years of experience on steep slopes. Only such experience could have made the feat possible. Jane had to be hauled up, and the task was a painful one for her. Lassiter's turn came then, and he showed more strength and agility than Shefford had supposed him capable of. 
From the ledge, they turned their attention to the narrow crack with its ladder of sticks. Fay had already ascended and now hung over the rim, her white face and golden hair framed vividly in the narrow stream of blue sky above. Mother Jane, Uncle Jim, you're so slow, she called. While well, Fay, we haven't been second cousins to a canyon squirrel all these years, replied Lassiter. This upper half of the climb bid fair to be as difficult for Jane, if not so painful, as the lower. It was necessary for the Indian to go up and drop the rope, which was looped around her, and then, with him pulling from above and Shefford assisting Jane as she climbed, she was finally gotten up without mishap. When Lassiter reached the level, they rested a little while and then faced the great slide of jumbled rocks. Fay led the way, light, supple, tireless, and Shefford never ceased looking at her. At last they surmounted the long slope and, winding along the rim, reached the point where Fay had led out of the cedars. Nas Te Bega, then, was the one to whom Shefford looked for every decision or action of the immediate future. The Indian said he had seen a pool of water in a rocky hole. That day was spent, that here was a little grass for the mustangs, and it would be well to camp right here. So while Nas Te Bega attended to the mustangs, Shefford set about such preparations for camp and supper as their light pack afforded. The question of beds was easily answered, for the mats of soft needles under pinion and cedar would be comfortable places to sleep. When Shefford felt free again, the sun was setting. Lassiter and Jane were walking under the trees. The Indian had returned to camp, but Fay was missing. Shefford imagined he knew where to find her, and upon going to the edge of the forest, he saw her sitting on the promontory. He approached her, drawn in spite of a feeling that perhaps he ought to stay away. Fay, would you rather be alone? he asked. His voice startled her. I want you, she replied, and held out her hand. Taking it in his own, he sat beside her. The red sun was at their backs. Surprise Valley lay hazy, dusky, shadowy beneath them. The opposite wall seemed fired by crimson flame, save far down at its base, which the sun no longer touched, and the dark lines of red slowly rose, encroaching upon the bright crimson. Changing, transparent yet dusky veils seemed to float between the walls. Long red rays, where the sun shone through notch or crack in the rim, split the darker spaces. Deep down at the floor, the forests darkened. The strip of aspen paled. The meadow turned gray. And all under the shelves and in the great caverns, a purple gloom deepened. Then the sun set and swiftly twilight was there below while day lingered above. On the opposite wall the fire died and the stone grew cold. A canyon nighthawk voiced his lonely, weird, and melancholy cry, and it seemed to pierce and mark the silence. A pale star peering out of a sky that had begun to turn blue marked the end of twilight, and all the purple shadows moved and hovered and changed till softly and mysteriously they embraced black night. Beautiful, wild, strange, silent, surprised valley. Shefford saw it before and beneath him, a dark abyss now, the abode of loneliness. He imagined faintly what was in Fay Larkin's heart. For the last time she had seen the sun set there and night come with its dead silence and sweet mystery and phantom shadows its velvety blue sky and white trains of stars. He who had dreamed and longed and searched found that the hour had become incalculable for him in its import. End of chapter 16《Part One of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trail to Nanesoshi 
Part One. When Shefford awoke next morning and sat up on his bed of pinion boughs, the dawn had broken cold, with a ruddy gold brightness under the trees. Nas Te Bega and Lassiter were busy around a campfire. The Mustangs were haltered nearby. Jane Witherstein combed out her long, tangled tresses with a crude wooden comb, and Fay Larkin was not in sight. As she had been missing from the group at sunset, so she was now at sunrise. Shefford went out to take his last look at Surprise Valley. On the evening before, the valley had been a place of dusky red veils and purple shadows, and now it was pink-walled, clear and rosy, and green and white, with wonderful shafts of gold slanting down from the notched eastern rim. Fay stood on the promontory, and Shefford did not break the spell of her silent farewell to her wild home. A strange emotion abided with him, and he knew he would always, all his life, regret leaving Surprise Valley. Then the Indian called. Come, Fay, said Shefford gently. And she turned away with dark, haunted eyes and a white, still face. The somber Indian gave a silent gesture for Shefford to make haste. While they had breakfast, the Mustangs were saddled and packed, and soon all was in readiness for the flight. Fay was given Nack Yall, Jane, the saddled horse Shefford had ridden, and Lassiter, the Indian's roan. Shefford and Nas Te Bega were to ride the blanketed Mustangs, and the sixth and last one bore the pack. Nas Te Bega set off, leading his horse, the others of the party lined in behind, with Shefford at the rear. Nas Te Bega led at a brisk trot, and sometimes, on level stretches of ground, at an easy canter, and Shefford had a grim realization of what this flight was going to be for these three fugitives, now so unaccustomed to riding. Jane and Lassiter, however, needed no watching, and they showed they had never forgotten how to manage a horse. The Indian back-trailed yesterday's path for an hour, then headed west to the left, and entered a low pass. All parts of this plateau country looked alike, and Shefford was at some pains to tell the difference of this strange ground from that which he had been over. In another hour they got out of the rugged, broken rock to the wind-worn and smooth, shallow canyon. Shefford calculated that they were coming to the end of the plateau. The low walls slanted lower. The canyon made a turn. Nas Te Bega disappeared, and then the others of the party. When Shefford turned the corner of wall, he saw a short strip of bare, rocky ground with only sky beyond. The Indian and his followers had halted in a group. Shefford rode to them, halted himself, and in one sweeping glance realized the meaning of their silent gaze. But immediately Nas Te Bega started down, and the Mustangs, without word or touch, followed him. Shefford, however, lingered on the promontory. His gaze seemed impelled and held by things afar, the great yellow and purple corrugated world of distance, now on a level with his eyes. He was drawn by the beauty and the grandeur of that scene, and transfixed by the realization that he had dared to venture to find a way through this vast, wild, and upflung fastness. He kept looking afar, sweeping the three-quartered circle of horizon till his judgment of distance was confounded and his sense of proportion dwarfed one moment and magnified the next. Then he withdrew his fascinated gaze to adopt the Indian's method of studying unlimited spaces in the desert, to look with slow, contracted eyes from near to far. His companions had begun to zigzag down a long slope, bare of rock, with yellow gravel patches showing between the scant strips of green, and here and there a scrub cedar. Half a mile down the slope merged into green level, but close, keen gaze made out this level to be a rolling plain, growing darker green, with blue lines of ravines and thin, 
undefined spaces that might be mirage. Miles and miles of it swept and relied and heaved to lose its waves in apparent darker levels. A round red rock stood isolated, marking the end of the barren plain. And farther on were other rocks, all isolated, all of different shapes. They resembled huge grazing cattle. But as Shefford gazed, and his sight gained strength from steady holding it to separate features, these rocks were strangely magnified. They grew and grew into mounds, castles, domes, crags, great red wind-carved buttes. One by one they drew his gaze to the wall of upflung rock. He seemed to see a thousand domes of a thousand shapes and colors, and among them a thousand blue clefts, each one a little mark in his sight, yet which he knew was a canyon. So far he gained some idea of what he saw, but beyond this wide area of curved lines rose another wall, dwarfing the lower, dark red, horizon-long, magnificent in frowning boldness and because of its limitless deceiving surfaces, breaks and lines incomprehensible to the sight of man. Away to the eastward began a winding, ragged blue line, looping back upon itself and then winding away again, growing wider and bluer. This line was the San Juan Canyon. Where was Joe Lake at that moment? Had he embarked yet on the river? Did that blue line, so faint, so deceiving, hold him and the boat. Almost it was impossible to believe. Shefford followed the blue line all its length, a hundred miles, he fancied, down toward the west, where it joined a dark, purple, shadowy cleft. And this was the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. Shefford's eyes swept along with that winding mark farther and farther to the west, round to the left, until the cleft, growing larger and coming closer, losing its deception, was seen to be a wild and winding canyon. Still further to the left, as he swung in fascinated gaze, it split the wonderful wall, a vast plateau now with great red peaks and yellow mesas. The canyon was full of purple smoke. It turned, it gaped, it lost itself, and showed again in that chaos of a million cliffs and then farther on it became again a cleft, a purple line, at last, to fail entirely into deceiving distance. Shefford imagined there was no scene in all the world equal to that. The tranquility of lesser spaces was not here manifest. Sound, movement, life seemed to have no fitness here. Ruin was there, and desolation and decay. The meaning of the ages was flung at him, and a man became nothing. When he had gazed at the San Juan Canyon, he had been appalled at the nature of Joe Lake's Herculean task. He had lost hope, faith. The thing was not possible. But when Shefford gazed at that sublime and majestic wilderness, in which the Grand Canyon was only a dim line, he strangely lost his terror, and something else came to him from across the shining spaces. If Nas Te Bega led them safely down to the river, if Joe Lake met them at the mouth of Nanesosha Boko, if they survived the rapids of that terrible gorge, then Shefford would have to face his soul and the meaning of this spirit that breathed on the wind. He urged his mustang to the descent of the slope, and as he went down, slowly drawing nearer to the other fugitives, his mind alternated between the strange intimation of faith, the subtle uplift of his spirit, and the growing gloom and shadow in his love for Fay Larkin. Not that he loved her less, but more, a possible god hovering near him, like the Indian's spirit stepped on the trail, made his soul the darker for Fay's crime, and he saw with light, with deeper sadness, with sterner truth. More than once the Indian turned on his mustang, to look up the slope, and the light flashed from his dark, somber face. Shefford instinctively looked back himself, and then he realized the unconscious motive of the action. Deep within him there had been a premonition of certain pursuit, 
and the Indian's reiterated backward glance had at length brought the feeling upward. Thereafter, as they descended, Shefford gradually added to his already wrought emotions a mounting anxiety. No sign of a trail showed where the base of the slope rolled out to meet the green plain. The earth was gravelly, with dark patches of heavy silt, almost like cinders, and round black rocks, flinty and glassy, cracked away from the hoofs of the mustangs. There was a level bench a mile wide, then a ravine, and then an ascent, and after that, rounded ridge and ravine, one after the other, like huge swells of a monstrous sea. Indian paintbrush vied in its scarlet hue with the deep magenta of cactus. There was no sage, soapweed and meager grass, and a bunch of cactus here and there lent the green to that barren, and it was green only at a distance. Nas Te Bega kept on a steady, even trot. The sun climbed, the wind rose, and whipped dust from under the mustangs. Shefford looked back often, and the farther out in the plain he reached, the higher loomed the plateau they had descended, and as he faced ahead again, the lower sank the red-domed and castled horizon to the fore. The ravines became deeper, with dry rock bottoms, and the high ridge tops sharper, with outcroppings of yellow, crumbling ledges. Once across the central depression of that plain, a gradual ascent became evident, and the round rocks grew cleaner in sight, began to rise, shine, and grow. And thereafter, every slope brought them nearer. The sun was straight overhead and hot when Nas Te Bega halted the party under the first lonely scrub cedar. They all dismounted to stretch their limbs and rest the horses. It was not a talkative group. Lassiter's comments on the never-ending green plain elicited no response. Jane Witherstein looked afar with the past in her eyes. Shefford felt Fay's wistful glance and could not meet it. Indeed, he seemed to want to hide something from her. The Indian bent a falcon gaze on the distant slope, and Shefford did not like that intent searching steadfast watchfulness. Suddenly, Nas Te Bega stiffened and whipped the halter he held. Ugh! he exclaimed. All eyes followed the direction of his dark hand. Puffs of dust rose from the base of the long slope they had descended. Tiny dark specks moved with the pace of a snail. Shad, added the Indian. I expected it, said Shefford, darkly as he rose. And who shad? drawled Lassiter in his cool, slow speech. Briefly, Shefford explained, and then looking at Naste Bega, he added, The hardest riding outfit in the country. We can't get away from them. Jane Witherstein was silent, but Fay uttered a low cry. Shefford did not look at either of them. The Indian began swiftly to tighten the saddle cinches of his roan, and Shefford did likewise for Nack Yall. Then Shefford drew his rifle out of the saddle sheath and Joe Lake's big guns from the saddlebag. Here, Lassiter, maybe you haven't forgotten how to use these, he said. The old gunman started as if he had seen ghosts. His hands grew claw-like as he reached for the guns. He threw open the cylinders, spilled out the shells, snapped back the cylinders. Then he went through motions too swift for Shefford to follow. But Shefford heard the hammers falling so swiftly they blended their clicks almost in one sound. Lassiter reloaded the guns with a speed comparable with the other actions. A remarkable transformation had come over him. He did not seem the same man. The mild eyes had changed. The long, shadowy, sloping lines were tense cords, and there was a cold, ashy shade on his face. Twelve years, he muttered to himself. I dropped them old guns back there where I rolled the rock. Twelve years. Shefford realized the twelve years were as if they had never been. And he would rather have had this old gunman with him than a dozen ordinary men. 
The Indians spoke rapidly in Navajo, saying that once in the rocks they were safe. Then, after another look at the distant dust puffs, he wheeled his mustang. It was doubtful if the party could have kept near him had they been responsible for the gait of their mounts. The fact was that the way the Indian called to his mustangs or some leadership in the one road drew the others to a like trot or climb or canter. For a long time, Shefford did not turn round. He knew what to expect. And when he did turn, he was startled at the gain made by the pursuers. But he was encouraged as well by the looming, red, rounded peaks seemingly now so close. He could see the dark splits between the sloping curved walls, the pinion patches in the amphitheater under the circled walls. That was a wild place they were approaching, and once in there he believed pursuit would be useless. However, they were miles still to go, and those hard-riding devils behind made alarming decrease in the intervening distance. Shefford could see the horses plainly now, how they made the dust fly. He counted up the six, and then the dust and moving line caused the others to be indistinguishable. At last, only a long, gently rising slope separated the fugitives from that labyrinthine network of wildly carved rock. But it was the clear air that made the distance seem short. Mile after mile the Mustangs climbed, and when they were perhaps halfway across the last slope to the rocks, the first horse of the pursuers mounted to the level behind. In a few moments the whole band was strung out in sight. Nas Te Bega kept his mustang at a steady walk, in spite of the gaining pursuers. There came a point, however, when the Indian, reaching comparatively level ground, put his mount to a swinging canter. The other mustangs broke into the same gait. It became a race, then, with a couple of miles between fugitives and pursuers only imperceptibly lessened. Nas Te Bega had saved his mustangs, and Shad had ridden his to the limit. Shefford kept looking back, gripping his rifle, hoping it would not come to a fight, yet slowly losing the reluctance. Sage began to show on the slope, and other kinds of brush and cedars straggled everywhere. The great rocks loomed closer, the red color mixed with yellow, and the slopes lengthening out, not so steep, yet infinitely longer than they had seemed at a distance. Shefford ceased to feel the dry wind in his face. They were already in the lee of the wall. He could see the rock squirrels scampering to their holes. The mustangs valiantly held to the gate, and at last the Indian disappeared between two rounded corners of cliff. The others were close behind. Shefford wheeled once more, Shad and his gang were a mile in the rear, but coming fast despite winded horses. Shefford rode around the wall into a widening space thick with cedars. It ended in a bare slope of smooth rock. Here the Indian dismounted. When the others came up with him, he told them to lead their horses and follow. Then he began the ascent of the rock. It was smooth and hard, though not slippery. There was not a crack. Shefford did not see a broken piece of stone. Nas Te Bega climbed straight up for a while, and then wound around a swell, to turn this way and that, always going up. Shefford began to see similar mounds of rock all around him, of every shape that could be called a curve. There were yellow domes far above, and small red domes far below. Ridges ran from one hill of rock to another. There were no abrupt breaks, but holes and pits and caves were everywhere, and occasionally, deep down, an amphitheater green with cedar and pinion. The Indian appeared to have a clear idea of where he wanted to go, though there was no vestige of a trail on those bare slopes. At length, Shefford was high enough to see back upon the plain, but the pursuers were no longer in sight. Nas Te Bega led to the top of that wall, only to disclose to his followers another and higher wall beyond, 
with a ridged, bare, wild, and scalloped depression between. Here footing began to be precarious for both man and beast. When the ascent of the second wall began, it was necessary to zigzag up, slowly and carefully, taking advantage of every level bulge or depression. They must have consumed half an hour mounting the slope to the summit. Once there, Shefford drew a sharp breath with both backward and forward glances. Shad and his gang in a single file showed dark upon the bare stone ridge behind, and to the fore there twisted and dropped and curved the most dangerous slopes Shefford had ever seen. The fugitives had reached the height of a stone wall, of the divide, and many of the drops upon this side were perpendicular and too steep to see the bottom. Nas Te Bega led along the ridge top and then started down, following the waves in the rock. He came out upon a rounded promontory from which there could not have been any turning of a horse. The long slant leading down was at an angle. Shefford declared impossible for the animals, yet the Indians started down. His mustang needed urging, but at last edged upon the steep descent. Shefford and the others had to hold back and wait. It was thrilling to see the intelligent mustang. He did not step. He slid his four hoofs a few inches at a time and kept directly behind the Indian. If he fell, he would knock Nas Te Bega off his feet, and they would both roll down together. There was no doubt in Shefford's mind that the Mustang knew this as well as the Indian. Foot by foot they worked down to a swelling bulge, and here Nas Te Bega left his Mustang and came back for the pack horse. It was even more difficult to get this beast down. Then the Indian called for Lassiter and Jane and Fay to come down. Shefford began to keep a sharp lookout behind and above. He did not see how the three fared on the slope, but evidently there was no mishap. Nas Te Bega mounted the slope again, and at the moment sight of Shad's dark bays silhouetted against the sky caused Shefford to call out. We've got to hurry. The Indian led one mustang and called to the others. Shefford stepped close behind. They went down in single file, inch by inch, foot by foot, and safely reached the comparative level below. Shad's gang are riding their horses up and down these walls, exclaimed Shefford. Sure, replied Lassiter. Both the women were silent. Nas Te Bega led the way swiftly to the right. He rounded a huge dome, climbed a low rolling ridge, descended and ascended, and came out upon the rim of a steep-walled amphitheater. Along the rim was a yard-wide level, with the chasm to the left and steep slope to the right. There was no time to flinch at the danger, when even a greater danger menaced from the rear. Nas Te Bega led, and his mustang kept at his heels. One misstep would have plunged the animal to his death, but he was sure-footed, and his confidence helped the others. At the apex of the curve, the only course led away from the rim, and here there was no level. Four of the mustangs slipped and slid down the smooth rock till they stopped in a shallow depression. It cost time to get them out, to straighten pack and saddles. Shefford thought he heard a yell in the rear, but he could not see anything of the gang. They rounded this precipice only to face a worse one. Shefford's nerve was sorely tried when he saw steep slants everywhere, all apparently leading down into chasms, and no place a man, let alone a horse, could put a foot with safety. Nevertheless, the imperturbable Indian never slackened his pace. Always he appeared to find a way, and he never had to turn back. His winding course, however, did not now cover much distance in a straight line, and herein lay the greatest peril. Any moment Shad and his men might come within range. Upon a particularly tedious and dangerous slide of Rocky Hill, the fugitives lost so much time that Shefford grew exceedingly alarmed. Still, they accomplished it without accident, and their pursuers 
did not heave in sight. Perhaps they were having trouble in a bad place. The afternoon was waning. The red sun hung low above the yellow mesa to the left, and there was a perceptible shading of light. End of Chapter 17, Part 1《17 17.2 Part two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trail to Nanesh Soshi, Part two. At last Nas Te Bega came to a place that halted him. It did not look so bad as places they had successfully passed. Yet upon closer study, Shefford did not see how they were to get around the neck of the gully at their feet. Presently, the Indian put the bridle over the head of his mustang and left him free. He did likewise for two more mustangs, while Lassiter and Shefford rendered a like service to theirs. Then the Indian started down, with his mustang following him. The pack animal came next, then Fay and Nack yaw, then Lassiter and his mount, with Jane and hers next, and Shefford last. They followed the Indian picking their steps swiftly, looking nowhere except at the stone under their feet. The right side of the chasm was rimmed, the curve at the head crossed, and then the real peril of this trap had to be faced. It was a narrow slant of ledge, doubling back, parallel with the course already traversed. A sharp warning cry from Neste Bega scarcely prepared Shefford for hoarse yells, and then a rattling rifle volley from the top of the slope opposite. Bullets thudded on the cliff, whipped up red dust, and spanged and droned away. Fay Larkin screamed and staggered back against the wall. Nack yaw was hit, and with frightened snort he reared, pawed the air, and came down, pounding the stone. The mustang behind him went to his knees, sank with his head over the rim, and, slipping off, plunged into the depths. In an instant, a dull crash came up. For a moment there was eminent peril for the horses, more in the yawning hole than in the spanging of badly aimed bullets. Lassiter drew Jane up a little slope, out of the way of the frightened mustangs, and Shefford, risking his neck, rushed to Fay. She was holding her arm, which was bleeding. Unheeding the rain of bullets, he half carried, half dragged her along the slope of the low bluff where he hid behind a corner till the Indian drove the mustangs round it. Shefford's swift fingers were wet and red with the blood from Fay's arm when he bound the wound with his scarf. Lassiter had gotten around with Jane and was calling Shefford to hurry. It had been Shefford's idea to halt there and fight, but he did not want to send Fay on alone, so he hurried ahead with her. The Indian had the horses going fast on a long level overhung by bulging walls. Lassiter and Jane were looking back. Shefford became aware of a steep slope to his left, looked down to see a narrow chasm and great crevices in the cliffs, with bunches of cedars here and there. Presently Nas Te Bega disappeared with the mustangs. He had evidently turned off to go down behind the split cliffs. Shefford and Fay caught up with Lassiter and Jane, and panting, hurrying, looking backward and then forward, they kept on as best they could in the Indian's course. Shefford made sure they had lost him when he appeared down to the left. Then they all ran to catch up with him. They went around the chasm and then through one of the narrow cracks to come out upon the rim among cedars. Here the Indian waited for them. He pointed down another long swell of naked stone to a narrow green split, which was evidently different from all these curved pits and holes and abysses, for this one had straight walls and wound away out of sight. It was the head of a canyon. Nane Soshi Boko, said the Indian. Naste Bega, go on, replied Shefford. When Shad comes out on that slope above, he can't see you where you go down. Hurry on with the horses and women. Lassiter, you go with them. And if Shad passes me and comes up with you, do your best. 
I'm going to ambush that Paiute and his gang. Sure you've picked out a good place, replied Lassiter. In another moment, Shefford was alone. He heard the light, soft pat and slide of the hoofs of the Mustangs as they went down. Presently, that sound ceased. He looked at the red stain on his hands, from the blood of the girl he loved, and he had to stifle a terrible wrath that shook his frame. In regard to Shad's pursuit, it had not been blood that he had feared, but capture for Fay. He and Nas Te Bega might have expected a shot if they resisted, but to wound that unfortunate girl, it made a tiger out of him. When he had stilled the emotions that weakened and shook him, and reached cold and implacable control of himself, he crawled under the cedars to the rim, and well hidden, he watched and waited. Shad appeared to be slow for the first time since he had been sighted. With keen eyes, Shefford watched the corner where he and the others had escaped from that murderous volley. But Shad did not come. The sun had lost its warmth and was tipping the lofty mesa to his right. Soon, twilight would make travel on those walls more perilous and darkness would make it impossible. Shad must hurry or abandon the pursuit for that day. Shefford found himself grimly hopeful. Suddenly he heard the click of hoofs. It came, faint yet clear, on the still air. He glued his sight upon that corner where he expected the pursuers to appear. More cracks of hoofs pierced his ear, clearer and sharper this time. Presently he gathered that they could not possibly come from beyond the corner he was watching. So he looked far to the left of that place, seeing no one then far to the right. Out over a bulge of stone, he caught sight of the bobbing head of a horse, then another, and still another. He was astounded. Shad had gone below that place where the attack had been made, and he had come up this steep slope. More horses appeared to the number of eight. Shefford easily recognized a low, broad, squat rider to be Shad. Assuredly, the Paiute did not know this country. Possibly, however, he had feared an ambush. But Shefford grew convinced that Shad had not expected an ambush, or at least did not fear it, and had mistaken the Indian's course. Moreover, if he led his gang a few rods further up that slope, he would do worse than make a mistake. He would be facing a double peril. What fearless horsemen these Indians were! Shad was mounted, as were three others of his gang. Evidently the white men, the outlaws, were the ones on foot. Shefford thrilled, and his veins stung, when he saw these pursuers come passing what he considered the danger mark. But manifestly they could not see their danger. Assuredly they were aware of the chasm, however. The level upon which they were advancing narrowed gradually, and they could not tell that very soon they could not go any farther, nor could they turn back. The alternative was to climb the slope, and that was a desperate chance. They came up, now about on level with Shefford, and perhaps three hundred yards distance. He gripped his rifle with a fatal assurance that he could kill one of them now. Still he waited. Curiosity consumed him because every foot they advanced heightened their peril. Shefford wondered if Shad would have chosen that course if he had not supposed the Navajo had chosen it first. It was plain that one of the walking Paiutes stooped now and then to examine the rock. He was looking for some faint sign of a horse track. Shad halted within two hundred yards of where Shefford lay hidden. His keen eye had caught the significance of the narrowing level before he had reached the end. He pointed and spoke. Shefford heard his voice. The others replied. They all looked up at the steep slope, down into the chasm right below them, and across into the cedars. The Paiute in the rear succeeded in turning his horse and went back, and began to circle up the slope. The others entered into an argument and they became more closely grouped upon the narrow bench. Their mustangs were lean, wiry, wild, vicious, 
and Shefford calculated grimly upon what a stampede might mean in that position. Then Shad turned his mustang up the slope. Like a goat he climbed. Another Indian in the rear succeeded in pivoting his steed and started back, apparently to circle round and up. The others of the gang appeared uncertain. They yelled hoarsely at Shad, who halted on the steep slant some twenty paces above them. He spoke and made motions that evidently meant the climb was easy enough. It looked easy for him. His dark face flashed red in the rays of the sun. At this critical moment, Shefford decided to fire. He meant to kill Shad, hoping if the leader was gone, the others would abandon their pursuit. The rifle wavered a little as he aimed, then grew still. He fired. Shad never flinched, but the fiery Mustang, perhaps wounded, certainly terrified, plunged down with piercing, horrid scream. Shad fell under him. Shrill yells rent the air. Like a thunderbolt, the sliding horse was upon men and animals below. A heavy shock, wild snorts, upflinging heads and hoofs, a terrible, tramping, thudding, shrieking melee. Then a brown, twisting, tangled mass shot down the slant over the rim. Shefford dazedly thought he saw men running. He did not see plunging horses. One slipped, fell, rolled, and went into the chasm. Then up from the depths came a crash, a long, slipping roar. In another instant there was a lighter crash and a lighter sliding roar. Two horses, shaking, paralyzed with fear, were left upon the narrow level. Beyond them a couple of men were crawling along the stone. Up on the level stood the two Indians, holding down frightened horses and staring at the fatal slope. And Shefford lay there under the cedar, in the ghastly grip of the moment, hardly comprehending that his ill-aimed shot had been a thunderbolt. He did not think of shooting at the Piutes. They, however, recovering from their shock, evidently feared the ambush, for they swiftly drew up the slope and passed out of sight. The frightened horses below whistled and tramped along the lower level, finally vanishing. There was nothing left on the bare wall to prove to Shefford that it had been the scene of swift and tragic death. He leaned from his covert and peered over the rim. Hundreds of feet below, he saw dark growths of pinions. There was no sign of a pile of horses and men, and then he realized that he could not tell the number that had perished. The swift finale had been as stunning to him as if lightning had struck near him. Suddenly it flashed over him what state of suspense and torture Fay and Jane must be in at that very moment, and leaping up, he ran out of the cedars to the slope behind, and hurried down at risk of limb. The sun had set by this time. He hoped he could catch up with the party before dark. He went straight down, and the end of the slope was a smooth, low wall. The Indian must have descended with the horses at some other point. The canyon was about fifty yards wide, and it headed under the great slope of Navajo Mountain. These smooth, rounded walls appeared to end at its low rim. Shefford slid down upon a grassy bank, and finding the tracks of the horses, he followed them. They led along the wall. As soon as he had assured himself that Nas Te Bega had gone down the canyon, he abandoned the tracks and pushed ahead swiftly. He heard the soft rush of running water. In the center of the canyon wound heavy lines of bright green foliage bordering a rocky brook. The air was close, warm, and sweet with perfume of flowers. The walls were low and shelving, and soon lost that rounded appearance peculiar to the wind-worn slopes above. Shefford came to where the horses had plowed down a gravelly bank into the clear, swift water of the brook. The little pools of water were still muddy. Shefford drank, finding the water cold and sweet without the bitter bite of alkali. He crossed and pushed on, running on the grassy levels. Flowers were everywhere, but he did not notice them particularly. The canyon 
made many leisurely turns, and its size, if it enlarged at all, was not perceptible to him yet. The rims above him were perhaps fifty feet high. Cottonwood trees began to appear along the brook, and blossoming buck brush in the corners of wall. He had traveled perhaps a mile when Nas Te Bega, appearing to come out of the thicket, confronted him. Hello, called Shefford. Where's Fay and the others? The Indian made a gesture that signified the rest of the party were beyond a little way. Shefford took Nas Te Bega's arm, and as they walked, and he panted for breath, he told what had happened back on the slopes. The Indian made one of his singular, speaking sweeps of hand, and he scrutinized Shefford's face, but he received the news in silence. They turned a corner of wall, crossed a wide, shallow, border-strewn place in the brook, and mounted the bank to a thicket. Beyond this, from a clump of cottonwoods, Lassiter strode out with a gun in each hand. He had been hiding. "'Sure I'm glad to see you,' he said, and the eyes that piercingly fixed on Shefford were now as keen as formerly they had been mild. "'Gone, Lassiter, they're gone,' broke out Shefford. "'Where's Fay and Jane?' Lassiter called, and presently the women came out of the thick break, and Fay bounded forward with her swift stride, while Jane followed with eager step and anxious face. Then they all surrounded Shefford. It was Shad and his gang, panted Shefford, eight in all, three or four Paiutes, the others outlaws. They lost track of us, went below the place where they shot at us, and they came up on a bad slope. Shefford described the slope and the deep chasm, and how Shad led up to the point where he saw his mistake, and then how the catastrophe fell. I shot and missed, repeated Shefford, with the sweat in beads on his pale face. I missed Shad. Maybe I hit the horse. He plunged, reared, fell back, a terrible fall, right upon the bunch of horses and men below. In a horrible wrestling, screaming tangle, they slid over the rim. I don't know how many. I saw some men running along. I saw three other horses plunging. One slipped and went over. I have no idea how many, but Shad and some of his gang went to destruction. Sure, that's fine, said Lassiter, but maybe I won't get to use them guns after all. Hardly on that gang, laughed Shefford. The two Paiutes and what others escaped turned back. Maybe they'll meet a posse of Mormons, for of course the Mormons will track us too, and come back to where Shad lost his life. That's an awful place. Even the Paiute got lost, couldn't follow Nas Te Bega. It would take any pursuer some time to find out how we got in here. I believe we need not fear further pursuit, certainly not tonight or tomorrow. Then we'll be far down the canyon. When Shefford concluded his earnest remarks, the faces of Fay and Jane had lost the signs of suppressed dread. Nas Te Bega, Make camp here, said Shefford. Water, wood, grass. Why, this is something like... Fay, how's your arm? It hurts, she replied simply. Come with me down to the brook and let me wash and bind it properly. They went, and she sat upon a stone while he knelt beside her and untied his scarf from her arm. As the blood had hardened, it was necessary to slit her sleeve to the shoulder. Using his scarf, he washed the blood from the wound, and found it to be merely a cut, a groove on the surface. That's nothing, Shefford said lightly. It'll heal in a day, but there'll always be a scar. And when we, we get back to civilization, and you wear a pretty gown without sleeves, people will wonder what made this mark on your beautiful arm. Fay looked at him with wonderful eyes. Do women wear gowns without sleeves? she asked. They do. Have I a beautiful arm? She stretched it out, white, blue veined, the skin fine as satin, the lines graceful and flowing, a round, firm, strong arm. The most beautiful I ever saw, he replied. But the pleasure his compliment gave her 
was not communicated to him. His last impression of that right arm had been of its strength. And his mind flashed with lightning swiftness to a picture that haunted him. Wagoner laying dead on the porch with that powerfully driven knife in his breast. Shefford shuddered through all his being. Would this phantom come often to him like that? Hurriedly he bound up her arm with the scarf and did not look at her, and was conscious that she felt a subtle change in him. The short twilight ended, with the fugitives comfortable in camp that for natural features could not have been improved upon. Darkness found Fay and Jane asleep on a soft, mossy bed, a blanket tucked around them, and their faces still and beautiful in the flickering campfire light. Lassiter did not linger long awake. Nas Te Bega, seeing Shefford's excessive fatigue, urged him to sleep. Shefford demurred, insisting that he share the night watch. But Nas Te Bega, by agreeing that Shefford might have the following night's duty, prevailed upon him. Shefford seemed to shut his eyes upon darkness and to open them immediately to the light. The stream of blue sky above, the gold tints on the western rim, the rosy, brightened colors down in the canyon were proofs of the sunrise. This morning Nas Te Bega proceeded leisurely, and his manner was comforting. When all was in readiness for a start, he gave the mustang he had ridden to Shefford and walked, leading the pack animal. The mode of travel here was a selection of the best levels, the best places to cross the brook, the best bank to climb, and it was a process of continual repetition. As the Indian picked out the course and the Mustangs followed his lead, there was nothing for Shefford to do but take his choice between reflection that seemed predisposed toward gloom and an absorption in the beauty, color, wildness, and changing character of Nona Soche Boko. Assuredly, his experience in the desert did not count in it a trip down into a strange, beautiful, lost canyon such as this. It did not widen, though the walls grew higher. They began to lean and bulge, and the narrow strip of sky above resembled a flowing blue river. Huge caverns had been hollowed out by some work of nature, what he could not tell, though he was sure it could not have been wind. And when the brook ran close under one of these overhanging places, the running water made a singular, indescribable sound. A crack from a hoof on a stone rang like a hollow bell and echoed from wall to wall, and the croak of a frog, the only living creature he had so far noted in the canyon, was a weird and melancholy thing. Fay rode close to him, and his heart seemed to rejoice when she spoke when she showed how she wanted to be near him, yet, try as he might, he could not respond. His speech to her, what little there was, did not come spontaneously, and he suffered a remorse that he could not be honestly natural to her. Then he would drive away the encroaching gloom, trusting that a little time would dispel it. We are deeper down than Surprise Valley, said Fay. How do you know? he asked. Here are the pink and yellow sago lilies. You remember, we went once to find the white ones. I have found white lilies in Surprise Valley, but never any pink or yellow. Shefford had seen flowers all along the green banks, but he had not marked the lilies. Here he dismounted and gathered several. They were larger than the white ones of higher altitudes, of the same exquisite beauty and fragility of such rare pink and yellow hues as he had never seen. He gave the flowers to Fay. They bloom only where it's always summer, she said. That expressed their nature. They were the orchids of the summer canyon. They stood up everywhere, star-like out of the green. It was impossible to prevent the mustangs treading them underfoot. And as the canyon deepened, and many little springs added their tiny volume to the brook, Every grassy bench was dotted with lilies, like a green sky star-spangled. And this increasing luxuriance manifested itself in the banks of purple moss 
and clumps of lavender daisies and great clusters of yellow violets. The brook was lined by blossoming buckrush. The rocky corners showed the crimson and magenta of cactus. Ledges were green with shining moss that sparkled with little white flowers. The hum of bees filled the air. By and by, this green and colorful and verdant beauty, the almost level floor of the canyon, the banks of soft earth, the thickets and the clumps of cottonwoods, the shelving caverns and the bulging walls, these features gradually were lost, and Nanesoshi Boko began to deepen in bare red and white stone steps. The walls sheared away from one another, breaking into sections and ledges, and rising higher and higher, and there began to be manifested a dark and solemn concordance with the nature that had created this rent in the earth. There was a stretch of miles where steep steps in hard red rock alternated with long levels of round boulders. Here, one by one, the mustangs went lame, and the fugitives, dismounting to spare the faithful beasts, slipped and stumbled over those loose and treacherous stones. Fay was the only one who did not show distress. She was glad to be on foot again, and the rolling boulders were as stable as solid rock for her. The hours passed, the toil increased, the progress diminished. One of the mustangs failed entirely and was left, and all the while the dimensions of Nanesoshi Boko magnified and its character changed. It became a thousand-foot walled canyon, leaning, broken, threatening, with great yellow slides blocking passage, with huge sections split off from the main wall with immense dark and gloomy caverns. Strangely, it had no intersecting canyon. It jealously guarded its secret. Its unusual formations of cavern and pillar and half-arch led the mind to expect any monstrous stone shape left by an avalanche or cataclysm. Down and down the fugitives toiled, and now the stream bed was bare of boulders and the banks of earth. The floods that had rolled down that canyon here had borne away every loose thing. All the floor was bare red and white stone, polished, glistening, slippery, affording treacherous foothold. And the time came when Naste Bega abandoned the stream bed to take to the rock strewn and cactus covered ledges above. Jane gave out and had to be assisted upon the weary Mustang. Fay was persuaded to mount Nakyal again. Lassiter plodded along. The Indian bent tired steps far in front, and Shefford traveled on after him, foot sore and hot. The canyon widened ahead into a great, ragged, iron-hued amphitheater, and from there apparently turned abruptly at right angles. Sunset rimmed the walls, Shefford wondered dully, when the Indian would halt to camp. And he dragged himself onward with eyes down on the rough ground. When he raised them again, the Indian stood on a point of slope with folded arms, gazing down where the canyon veered. Something in Nas Bega's pose quickened Shefford's pulse, and then his steps. He reached the Indian, and the point where he, too, could see beyond that vast jutting wall that had obstructed his view. A mile beyond was all bright with colors of sunset, and spanning the canyon in the graceful shape, arid beauty hues of a rainbow, was a magnificent stone bridge. Nane Soche, exclaimed the Navajo, with a deep and sonorous roll in his voice. End of chapter 17, part 2